Thank you. I appreciate the intro. Uh, and of course, for everybody catches the recording after, they won't hear your intro because uh, I'm not recording anyone but me, which is totally fine. I've got a little bit in here where I'm going to say a few things about it. One thing I will say, and this is a clarification I've been working on for years, and heck, this word might have been used while you were still with us because it's been a few years by now. But I try to avoid the word mentors because that means so many different things to different people about for some, it's like an interwork relationship where like there's a superior who's the manager and or there's cases of it's like a once a year conversation about just course correcting. And, and fundamentally, like a lot of what I do is really it's kind of closer to lessons. Like people meet with me to get actual hands on project help project planning stuff. And so just to say it's closer to different versions, different things. But yeah, I, I will. I will. It's not wrong. Um, it just seems different things, different folks. And so I've been careful about. Um, semantics of things. Uh, I will pull up my little sc- I guess like screen. Is already going. If folks want to kind of put that in focus, I don't have a lot to show on the slides. It's basically to loosely structure this stuff. Uh, as it says, this is new game developer stress, layoffs, engines, and early career tips. Uh, I am locally recording this. I'm not yet sure which pieces I will use publicly or release on YouTube, etc. Uh, no one else is being recorded, so no one else is a voice, video, text, and so it's also hopefully someone can remind me if I fail at this. Even if you ask me a question. In text or hell, in voice, I will try to echo back what you asked, because otherwise, in the result, no one will have any idea. Uh, So brief background speaker about me. I Like Brian mentioned, I run Home Team Game Dev currently. That's been going on now for nine years. That's a worldwide group of people in about 19 time zones making games together. We released 200 games this way on two to six month schedules over that time. All freeware, a mixture of simple dinner for portfolio reasons, for fun reasons. Some have industry jobs, and this is their weird stuff they do on the side. Mix of all of the above, including very experienced people and very inexperienced people who all kind of coexist in a learning space. Uh, before that, though, I've been a game since 1997, starting as a hobbyist for several years, then professionally since 2005. Had some early career success. I was a technical game designer on some console games for EA, one of which wound up at the Smithsonian. Uh, pretty thrilled about that. Uh, it's kind of a little featured moment. And another was a web game played by millions of people. Miss Vision by Proxy. As web games go, these th- things get forgotten. Uh, made a launch title for iPhone that did incredibly well for a publisher. Uh, as the nature of being early in my career without lawyers and so on, I didn't quite know what I was doing business-wise. And so it was helpful to my career that I had in my portfolio, but I've made other people rich and not me. So anyway, that's a bit of my backstory. And then fundamentally, I liked different things that I did in making games. I was also helping with PopCap San Francisco before it was called that, doing different things that they were doing at that studio. Uh, but really, most of my work has been helping other people do what they want to do out of making games. The games they feel like making, finding their way into the careers they're after, different directions they go, I kind of help advise people on that stuff. Now, even though industry is not my primary focus, I'm not fundamentally running a vocational program, it's not the whole point, uh, we have out of the groups I've established, and by now I started a game club at undergrad in 2004, 20 years ago, 2010 in grad school, 14 years ago. My current home team groups, I run three of them. They started in 2015, 2019, and 2021, also running a parallel collectively have released 500 games out of those alumni have gone on to a variety of different places in the industry now granted two of those five groups also have pretty strong college degrees footings in comp sci or related programs connection with alumni uh i think of it as part of a balanced breakfast uh and there are cases where people have also gone to a game school got a games degree couldn't find the job that was the shape they were after they could have maybe found a different job another one that they were they're trying to go towards then used our groups to kind of supplement their portfolio in a direction of Heck, if I could just add showing I've been using Unreal 5 or doing VR or made a mobile supporting game or a certain style or genre that's going to look better in my portfolio for the kind of place I want to go, we're very flexible at what we do. And so for some people, it's been a chance to kind of build those foundations or just those connections. Of The other thing you'll see in here are some companies where people found each other through our groups and then started doing things together because they figured out more than the game they prototyped, they like the teammates they've tried working with in terms of we get along, we're on the same page. We, we connect well, that kind of stuff. But again, my focus is really on helping people make games for a lifetime out of which a career may or may not uh, intersect. And I think of this a bit like when Bob Ross is teaching painting, right? He's not fundamentally talking about when the painting industry is good, how to get a job painting paintings for other people. He's like, it's it's enriching. It's good for your personal development. It's something we should all maybe try and explore. It's a nice thing in our lives out of which there's nothing wrong with if people find ways to make a living doing it. But uh, in and out of industry, there's been years where I was doing lots of full-time day job stuff in games. There's other years where I was doing adjacent things, helping run events, uh, organize with Indicate for a bunch of years, or teaching, as a, whether it's a home team or a part-time gig this past school year at Northeastern University. But this is also a pretty common thing. It's kind of like if you look at a lot of musicians, there are plenty of folks doing music commercially, professionally. There's also a whole lot more people who aren't necessarily 
on sold out stages in arenas, but are, I don't know, maybe playing the local bars, playing birthday events, have a group, they garage band practice together. It's a part of their lives. I think culture, whether it's music, whether it's art, whether it's games, whether it's story writing, et cetera, are so much bigger than just the industry we're looking at. That said, inevitably, a lot of people work with do have an industry focus. So we'll be obviously talking about that. And I know for some of y'all too, it might be where some more your questions or hanging points are. And with that industry note, uh, one of the high points of stress, obviously, is the layoff situation. I have to put a huge disclaimer in front of this that I worry if I don't disclaim, it will sound too much like I am in any way saying there's any good to be found. That's not what this is. This is all bad news. It's unfortunate. Wish it wasn't happening. I am, however, sort of a little bit of a silver lining or a pragmatist of how can I find the best lens that might help me in this situation. I also think that there's lots of things I would like to say to the people whose decisions are responsible for stuff going on. I don't think they'll listen to me. Who I can get to listen to me are people who are trying to early career, their students, their hobbyists, their people who've made some maybe jams or they've done some projects. They maybe have made a couple things on Steam or Android. They didn't really take off and try to figure out, do I want to keep doing this? That's who I mostly kind of speak to. And a couple of things to keep in mind is that one, uh, and again, in terms of layoffs, there's no, I was talking, what, 16,000 depends on which companies, which roles people are counting. But in that ballpark, that's a figure I've heard of in the past year. Maybe it's even gone up from that. Uh, people who are out of work from the situation they're after. A couple of things to keep in mind is that A, there are already patterns in the game industry in general. This has been the case for decades. This probably isn't going away where teams that are 15, 20, 40, maybe five, when they start, balloon as they mo go into a kind of wide production. There's this old thing called the Cerny Method. It's a free talk you can find just called The Method by Mark Cerny. 2002 GDC Europe and DICE Europe. You know, there's slides, there's YouTube videos. It's a great talk. But one of the discussions is kind of this method where you're kind of getting what we now often call a vertical slice nailed down of can I make a five minute, a three minute, one level, whatever snapshot of how this game would be if it's really was all done. This moment would be like the whole thing. Then they go wide. They hire up a bunch of people, bring on contractors to kind of flesh that out when they figured out, OK, this is what we're driving forward on. And then after that, unfortunately, there is often lots of folks who they're laid off or contracts not renewed. And one thing that happened was because early in the pandemic, games were a space that relatively seemed a little insulated against. It was more flexible for remote work. It was the kind of things that projects had an opportunity to kind of stay on the rails a little more than some other industries did. Lots of projects were starting, say, four years ago that are now probably in that phase. And so part of what we're seeing is a little bit of a lots of those crests and waves that used to be staggered and people would kind of be shifting around, moving, relocating, et cetera, for, for gigs. A lot of those things, unfortunately, have been, again, coinciding. That's on top of, of course, there are other things that affect all industries out of which games is not unique, whether that's banking interest rates, whether that is uh, consumer spending, whether it's just weird things going on in tech in that kind of environment, out of which we are not uh, excluded from those results. Uh, the other thing that though, people worry about is that, okay, well, does this mean that there's a whole lot of very experienced people who are displaced who are competing for the same roles as you? And a couple things to think about that if you're a newcomer to finding your footing, your entry level positions and so on, in most cases, and granted, there's percentages, probabilities, gray area, you know, it's hard to speak in absolutes when it comes to human beings and populations. For the most part, the kind of people who are very experienced in between roles probably aren't looking at the same positions you are. They wouldn't take that job. It'd be too many steps backwards or in the wrong direction for them. It would be below, it'd be too many pay decrease. And they're more likely to find an adjacent role if they can for their skill set in some other sphere where as a programmer, as a project manager, as a designer, as something else, they can bring those skills and feel like they're still making forward progress. And speaking to that point as well of those positions that you're looking at and who is there and competing for them. The other thing you might actually see and kind of counterintuitively when the industry is doing excellent, when it's like a booming year and there's just lots of studios spinning up and investor funding going around, whatever that actually draws a lot more competition to be applying for things because it seems like a really hot space to be in. And we see these waves of what all the degrees, people's aspirations, YouTube channels, influencers, people point people towards. Right now, the opposite is happening for the game industry, which is to say people who might have been on track to be competing with you for entry-level roles are in many cases kind of shaken and turned away from they're not, they're going to go figure out a plan B, C, D, or E. They're, they, you know, this does not look like a wise investment for them. And so there may actually be a fraction or percentage fewer resumes rolling in towards any given role you're looking at, out of which there are still at any given time companies that do need somebody for some reason. They might not necessarily be the exact kind you had in mind, but there are positions. We've had people out of home team groups and out of students that I know who've been able to find entry-level roles in the past year or two during complicated times. 
because again, there are companies hiring and it's a little bit like the dating challenge of you don't need a whole population percentage wise that works. You need to find one good match. And the same is true for how do those people who are looking for these roles find those opportunities or find the, the matches for what they're doing? How do you get in front of them? How do you find that you have a stronger case for them in preparing your portfolio? I'll, t- I'll talk a little bit about the practicalities of that as we get to the kind of early career tips things. But again, it is not that there are no openings. That said, and this is kind of a general truism again for games, whether or not this is what's going on in terms of layoffs situation, is you do want to have fallback plans. You do want to be typically not counting on just assuming I'll just kind of easily get funding or we'll easily, we'll make one title, it'll pay for this one and the next ones, or that there's just going to be easy jobs to find. It it is the kind of industry where it is often trying to make sure you've got a decent solid plan B wherever possible. You're maintaining a runway while you're still working on kind of building up your skills, your portfolio. Uh, The folks who kind of go both feet in, all in on indie or something, or uh, abandoned the, the kind of safe thing that they were doing for something a little more uh, challenging. We obviously we hear some success stories. More often than not, uh, they wind up not having enough runway to get to the results that they were after. And this is where, again, where you can, the priority needs to be figuring out how do you make sure you can stay in the fight. And there's this old model from Silicon Valley about unicorns. And it's like, you know, you go, you go huge or you just, you go extinct. And I can't remember who wrote the article. I feel like it was probably 2007 ish. So it's been a while, but it's basically the cockroach model of how do I make sure I'm still there when nobody else is? How do I make sure I survive the tumult, the highs and the lows? And this has honestly clearly been my path in life of I've been doing this stuff professionally for 20 years. I am still here. Um, There are times it was not great years. There are times where it's better times and so on. But it's figuring out if I need a shape shift, how can it be adaptable? How can I stay also like up to date on the skills that I have that people are looking for, whether it's my students, whether it's companies I'm working for, uh, that agility is going to be important. And there's some other things there I could say that I'm going to probably save till the early career tips because it's going to kind of again relate to portfolio positioning strategy, looking for kind of roles that you're going after. Uh, but it is, I don't know, kind of an elephant in the room for a lot of people. The other thing I'll also say, there are people who are doing a good job tracking this data, who are very proactively offering resources to try to help people find their first opportunities or to update the portfolios or get feedback and stuff don't feel bad taking advantage of using those resources, right? Those people are organizing those efforts because they want you to use them. So this was a previous way off layoff wave. Cause again, this is game industry is like this on cycles. I think it was 2020, uh, obviously before the pandemic, we, I was the head of IG Los Angeles and we planned a local career fair because there were some major layoffs affecting a lot of employees in the greater LA area. And we wanted people to go there. Companies that were there wanted to find people and it helped everybody to be able to match up in that way. And so that's something to keep in mind that if you look for those resources, don't feel like, obviously, if it says it's only for someone who's been affected by layoffs, well, respect that. But in many cases, they're just trying to say that here are companies looking for matches. Uh, here are resources. Here are networks. Here are people who are open to volunteering for the situation. They're in. they want to mentor. They want to help advise. They want to help give portfolio feedback. Don't decline those. Those are in some ways more available now than they were a year ago because of how much game developers kind of band together, help each other out, want to support each other, want to kind of keep the community going as best they can. So keep an eye out for those kind of opportunities uh, that, that show up in these difficult times. Because again, game developers try to look out for each other. But let's let's get off this slide, uh, go on to something else, which also doesn't sound super fun. But again, the, the focus of this talk is stress. So here we are. I'm going to talk about game engines for a little bit, especially Unity. Uh, that one being the hot topic from the past year and still having some ripple effects and people's uncertainty about what they ought to be doing. And, and a couple things things I want to say about Unity. One, that I've been using it now for probably 15-ish years, uh, maybe a little longer than that. I wrote an old Game Developer review for it when it was relatively newer. It's been a really, really great fit for the size of teams that I work with, which are often small to mid-size. They're not full-size big companies. They're also not totally solo, but it's been a really good match for that in terms of the, the platform. Obviously, the complications, though, are business side. They have been the, the big splash in the water last year uh, was whether or not they were trying to change terms retroactively. It was whether or not uh, from that, even after they backed off, a whole lot of studios felt like they had spent a long time investing energy and experience in gaining muscle memory at this tool, at this platform, building their kind of foundation of it. And they felt shaken and concerned that it was going to affect their relationship to publishing opportunities. And this also were even for students who were obviously, and you know, visiting, say, the clubs at Northeastern, they knew that they were nowhere near the price cutoff points for the new terms to affect them, but they're still trying to look ahead because none of this stuff happens in a vacuum. They're worried about 
if I skill up in that, is it going to be jobs for me waiting to use it? And again, this is still, unfortunately, even though they kind of backed off some of those terms, even though they got rid of John Riccatello, and honestly, in some ways, I, I don't like JR. I kind of like less than people who are left in his absence. But the bigger concern that I think some of us are looking at for Unity is, again, it's a great tool. It's an absolutely a great tool for that size of team. It is that business fear of part of their thrashing, part of their investing in making these weird bets on, can we fight toe-to-toe and beat Unreal and VFX for Hollywood? And I think the answer is obviously no. And it looks like the market supported that. Or is that kind of weird moves that they're doing? The stress point is when it's a publicly traded company, as Unity is, they have to grow at a certain aggressive pace or they can't justify just doing what they're doing. And so the fear is, is it a signal that they're not going to stay the shape that we've always known them as? The thing that they've done that we found very useful, that was a good fit for us, especially as students, especially as hobbyists, as early career people, smaller studios. And it's starting to look like it was one of these situations where like so many things in Silicon Valley for the past, say, especially 20 years ago, whether it was Reddit or these other kind of websites, would just start on some premise of, or hell, Twitter for that matter, We're going to get a bazillion users and then we'll figure out how to monetize them by kind of offering a deal that if we had offered it up front, we would not have gotten a gazillion users. And so some concerns and anxieties around, is the tool still going to be here in five or 10 years? Is is some of the actual existential concern that we have? And it can sound kind of extreme because it's a great tool. And so is Adobe Flash, which I made some of my better played web games in, uh, taught early on in my career teaching, and obviously gone for all practical purposes. Yes, Adobe Animate exists. Yes, there's still Unity still using it. But these are some of the concerns that we have. And I'm not to say don't use Unity. It's a great fit for, again, small teams for your portfolio, for projects, for uh, game jams, for things you're doing for your capstones and stuff. But it's also to say not to put all your eggs in one basket. And this is also this normal thing for games as well. There were games I worked on for DOS and Windows 95 that don't run anymore. Uh, Obviously, again, the Flash games are gone. This is kind of the shape and space of games. Just to be aware of Platforms are going to change. I used to teach Java processing. Now I teach JavaScript in HTML5 instead for that stuff. These things keep changing. You got to kind of keep up with it. And so you just want to make sure you're not putting all your eggs in the basket. On the side, are you also learning Godot? Are you also learning Unreal 5? Are you also doing something else? Maybe some deep C++ proprietary graphics tinkering or something to inform yourself of a different skill set, depending on your objectives we'll get to in a moment. The, the challenge with that range is certainly Unreal 5 is by far and above the natural choice for larger studio jobs, for the bigger companies that have more roles. Those positions also tend to pay better the Unreal development roles than Unity. They're a less saturated space in part because Unreal is a less good fit for those small teams in many cases. So it means that you don't have the same built-in pipeline we've had from game jams, from college students, etc. And so they can often be, A, again, less competitive to find those roles, B, higher price point, The trade-off being it is such a more powerful engine. It's really built for full-time studios of experienced people with 40 plus hours a week, uh, large teams over long timeframes to really get the horsepower they can out of it. And I think of this example where if I need to plant some, I don't know, plant some things in my garden in the backyard, a shovel is a tool. Let's say that that's Unity. And so is like industrial commercial construction equipment, like a bulldozer, et cetera, which are immensely powerful but if I don't have a full trained crew of people who know exactly what the hell they're doing, I might also just kind of like tear down my fence by accident or ultimately not even get a hole out of it. And that feels more like where Unreal is. Again, it's incredibly powerful. I'll say even that we've had only recently we started adding support in home team of people trying to use Unreal, maybe starting about a year ago. We've had several games done in it. And it tends to be something where they kind of know up front that in most cases with maybe one or two exceptions, we had a really strong background in C++, a lot of years maybe even an Unreal 4 before doing UE5, that they kind of knew the game might even come out less good. Now, it might look better out the box, but in terms of they could have probably done more if they had done it in Unity, but its function was as a portfolio piece to try to move them towards a job where they can show I can do, I can string together the way that AI needs to work in this. I can help build these kind of systems in UI. I can do the network code that you need me to do in the context of Unreal. And the other thing to keep in mind for Unreal is even if you're looking at some other big companies that might use proprietary tech, not every single company out there is using an external license engine for, you know, business reasons. Their their tech that's proprietary is much more likely to be Unreal shaped in terms of its form factor, in terms of its industry left le- learnings, just from the scale of operation level of specialists working on it, than it is likely to look like Unity or on the other side of the spectrum, Godot. This is where, again, Godot and its ecosystem has been doing better. There are at least a few 
non-trivial commercial games that are either being done in it or have pivoted towards it with confidence that often have some extra momentum. The tough part with Godot, it's a great answer for if you want to do game jams, want to do hobby stuff, want to do stu- uh, studio stuff, artistic stuff on the side. We've had basically people in our groups who've tried to find some paying Godot gigs. And what they tended to find was even the better paying of those were still kind of lower than the lower to mid Unity opportunities. And so it hasn't yet proven that it's got that kind of traction for for roles. Now, again, that might change. There are people who are working on solutions to get it to deploy for platforms like consoles, that there's reasons why a open source nonprofit is not the great answer for that. So as a third party trying to help answer that question for good old games, there are studios that are trying to help support as a use case. But the hesitancy, again, is just that is, is it not there yet in terms of the evidence? And this is where when you're picking a tool set, whether it's for you and your team to release a game on, whether it's for your personal project, whether it's for trying to find company work, any given time, there's also dozens and dozens and dozens of engines. And I don't mean to say anything negative, folks who are trying to be helpful of a gathering list of all these other engines. But the thing I was looking for is like, where and how have these been used? Are these being used in which ways? Because if it's failed the test of there's lots of other teams who are really doing something with it, that's comparable to the thing that you're trying to do. There's usually some other kind of concern about are there challenges of why and how this doesn't actually deploy very easily and other people can't run the output? Is there problems of there's not enough of a base of users online discussing the challenge they run into it? And so I'll even say it again, back to go give Unity some credit out of it. I don't mean to sound like I'm just bashing. Again, plenty of folks in home team still choosing it. There's not a bad choice. It's just making sure all of one basket. But you often for years would hear a lot of complaints about Unity because people were using it. There was all kinds of stuff you never heard to complain about because it was not the right size and fit for their studio, for their team, for their project. And it has so often been straight up just the best fit for part-timing, switching roles, those kind of scale of projects that we tended to see. So I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic that it'll continue to to survive, be, be good in the ecosystem it's continued to be. We've seen a lot of good games come out of it. It's been useful in people's careers and paths. But it's just sort of a future-facing thing of these studios who feel like they're in a bad spot because they upskilled on it for so long and now feel kind of shaky about the foundations of the future. And so it's again, to not be afraid of other tech, which you might find very quickly is that there's some neat lessons you learn working in other tools. You might even be able to borrow those concepts and bring them back into updates you do to custom scripts in Unity or approaches you take to your level design framework in whatever tool you're in. So to not be bashful or shy about that stuff. But that's a bit of my game engine stress chat. Before we talk about some early career tips, and then I do want to leave some time for discussion at the end for questions and things, uh, a major part of what I've been focusing on really the past three, four months has been helping narrow down why people are making their own games. Because I'm starting to realize, as you might have heard already, the advice as to what you ought to be doing or thinking about varies on what you're trying to get out of things, where you're trying to go, why you're doing this. And the activity that moves you one direction may be unproductive, even counterproductive to another direction. If you're, there's a game you want to make and you're trying to just realize that. And I think about the filter for this. If you would rather your game exist, but frankly, it was not profitable or, you know, not successful as a business, didn't get fun, but your game exists the way you wanted it to. If that's important to you, that is a different lens than if you would rather have a higher paying job working on something else that maybe isn't something you're as jazzed about or it feels much ownership over, but that is a different way to shape and craft your portfolio to build your case to the kind of games you're thinking about and why you're building them which is different still from just kind of general enrichment. And again, I kind of alluded earlier to Bob Ross, but it's kind of this curiosity if I want to know why all the things work. And this is especially where your generalists tend to be. This is where a lot of people honestly start here because we've got curiosity. I want to see how, what's it like to make music and to do writing and to do level design, to do programming and to do all these kind of mixed sound effects. And I like all of that. That's all fine and good. Uh, those are useful to have, be able to fill in objectives. But that's a different lens than there is a career I'm after. We're really in a career in most cases they are looking for you. They want a, what we call a T pattern. You might be cross functioning fluent across other spaces, but you are getting hired because you are the answer to their shader problem because you are the better hand animator because you are somehow deeply specialized in character art or something else that they can't find someone better than on a bigger team is why the career stuff happens. And again, this is still in contrast to those folks who just want to make the game they want to make, in which case it's kind of a means to an end. If they have to learn something to make that happen, they're going to learn that but they're not out there learning for its own sake or just kind of curious or poking around. They are going for it. They might even make other projects as stepping stones towards it. Uh, I made this a little kind of, I call it Skyrim-like because you know when you start Skyrim and you kind of get interrogated by the person about how you would solve different situations for class or something. It's a little shaped like that, a little half kind of fantasy tongue-in-cheek. But anyway, whygamedev.com. You'll also get, if you choose to do that, 
a gift from my background of paid materials, so you're not paying anything for it, based on which track that kind of maps to what might help you on that way. So anyway, bit of a discussion there because all of the thing I'm about to discuss right now is really for career tips. This is different than if you were trying to make your own game that you just want to realize. This is in contrast to if you're just curious to learn things as a generalist because you like to know how things work. And so the, one of the very first things I'd like to throw out there, and we actually learned this from Rob Coble. He's a longtime career advisor, I believe, with Full Sail. He's now one of our advanced uh, people who helps out with Home Teams Network. Uh, people have kind of crossed certain hurdles of leading projects and stuff. But one of the first things he's suggesting is a universal tip for everybody is go out there and find a job you're not qualified for that you would like to become qualified for. And this is harder than it sounds because our reflex is when we find a job listing, uh, two things are true. One, if it's not for us, we slide right off it, right? Like we kind of, we just don't see it because, well, that's not me. But his point that he raises, right, is that that's a checklist. They're telling you, if you do these things, then you're the shape of an actual paid role at a company that exists. The other reason why we disregard this, because like, well, by the time I get those skills, this, this job is going to be long gone. And that may be true. But there's a pattern to these things, right? It's like looking for an apartment in Los Angeles. Yes, any given one of these may disappear, but there's kind of a pattern to what part of town, what size, what approximate price scale. And by the time your skills are brought to that level, a year or two from now, perhaps maybe three months from now, by the time your portfolio is the shape you wish it had been for that, there'll be other things roughly analogous popping up, or at least that's more likely to be the case than if you're just sort of speculating, imagining a shape of a job. You have the internet. Nothing is stopping you from just browsing what are things that I'm not qualified for? I'll say another reason people get hesitant about this is that they'll look at that and they'll say, okay, well, several of these, they want five years AAA experience. They want a PhD in it. They just, they want me to have a specialized comp side degree. There's stuff I don't have and I'm not going to do. A couple of things to keep in mind for this are that uh, one thing is that most people who are applying for these roles and getting them are I in different HR, different company. Again, there's no universals here. Um, they're often maybe meeting 85% of those checkboxes. And because the thing in mind, there is nothing that prevents a company from saying, you know what, I would love to pay you $36,000 and to have you be our like senior lead who's got a bunch of experience and a PhD and super connected and uh, also can do our back end and our community management, whatever. They can ask that and the market can just ignore it. And then they can try again if they're desperate and be like, okay, we'll pay a little more. We'll lower our requirements. But the reality is you're competing against other people who apply for the job. And someone who checks all those boxes very often, and I've sometimes been in this spot, I might check all the boxes. I'm not doing it for the amount of money that they're offering because that's just not going to be what I'm looking at. You're competing against the other human beings who apply who are also kind of like, well, I could learn a little bit of this on the job. And then they're back there trying to play Pokemon against each other in the company, assuming it's big enough to have more than a person in HR, of making their case for, yes, this person's kind of missing this piece, but I think we can kind of fill that in. All they're really worried about is who's the best person to do this work in terms of they've got evidence that they're not going to be embarrassed about bringing this person in. A bad hire is bad for the company. And you're trying to figure out what can you do to equip them so they can have a stronger case of, again, kind of playing their Pokemon cards, in those internal conversations, making a justifiable case where even if the hire goes wrong, well, at the time it made sense from the information that we had. And so that is something that you're thinking about when you're trying to work backwards from this portfolio or backwards from those requests of job descriptions. You're trying to figure out what can I give them that helps. And this is why when you're looking at things like would it help to do Unity certification, would it help to do uh, some sort of project management scrum certification, would it help to do X, Y, or Z or a certain kind or scale of project? The thing to be thinking about again is, is that going to help separate you from the pack of other people who don't and what kind of role you're looking at? There's no universal yes or no. Uh, The other thing you can sometimes do for some of these as well, since game credits are public, and I don't think this is too fishy. Again, it's a bit of doing your homework and due diligence. You can also go kind of look at portfolios and LinkedIn's and stuff of people who are working there and learn a bit about did, what did they do? And any given person, I'll put an asterisk next to this, may have got there in part because there was already trust established. They already had connections who were shared. They worked together somewhere else. So you don't want to read into that, assume it's 100% certain. But if you see a pattern and they have a lot of people who either have certain degrees or do or don't have certain certifications... Again, this is information that you're not even being sneaky. This is just publicly out there on the internet. You can get some context for what do people who this company's HR pipeline likes to bring in, what, what's their profile like? Is that a profile I can fit myself into to become the person that they want me to be? And this is also where I think about too, whether you're trying to do, say, freelance contracting stuff, whether you're trying to move towards a studio role, whether you're trying to get picked up for a team. Uh, a thing we often have people doing in home team is I think of it as expanding the size of their spider web. They're trying to increase the odds that there is a match in my portfolio or background for the kind of thing you're looking for. And this is one of my favorite examples. So this is a guy in Scandinavia. 
he's super upfront in the interview process. And the whole thing is like, hey, I know you're a VR company. I know we're probably a VR game, but like I did not even work on the VR part. I did the menus just so we're clear. Like, don't think I was the VR specialist. And like, yeah, 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 that's fine. But you know, it just, it still helped them do the Venn diagram of we know you've got gameplay programming background, which is what we need in this company. We're doing a VR project. And he may have been part of a VR team that released a VR game that finished. And so that helped his case. And it's one of these problems of the outside world will not believe what you can do until you've done something like it. Uh, your friends might trust you with that. You might trust yourself with that. Until you've actually done it, the world might not assume. You could do a platformer. You could do an infinite runner. You could do a match three. Uh, you could do a strategy game, whatever. And this is part of why people explore those spaces in their portfolios. If they want, again, kind of contract freelance or aren't quite sure what they're fishing for yet. They're trying to kind of broaden their surface area. After which, and again, where what you want is the bigger company roles. Then specialization is the name of the game in those kind of situations. Even there, I think it's been important for people to kind of explore first to figure out what is it they actually love doing? What do they not hate waking up and thinking about? Because at the large enough companies, some of the specialization is kind of to a degree of absurdity. And we had an alumni from home team. I believe he's no longer with a big AAA company. I'm not going to name check him because I don't know if he's still there. But he, you know, made a bunch of games as a home team, just having a fun time, made a boxing kangaroo with a jetpack and stuff. And then went off to a big AAA game company, worked some big titles people have heard of and his friends, family have heard of, his cousins have heard of, it's pretty cool. But he was pretty upfront when he came back as a speaker for us on a podcast talking about how, yeah, honestly, like he never even ran the game. He just opened up the animation test bed and pressed a bunch of buttons. And if the character T-posed, he was like, oh no, and had to write code all day to fix it. And like, that was his relationship to that project. He's still proud to work on it, got paid well, treated fairly, didn't have a negative experience. But as he put it, the club student scale game making is more of like when he was a kid thinking about game making, what might be fun or interesting about it was like, was where it was not the commercial stuff. In contrast to the game comes out much more polished this way. I know somebody else is working on another big AAA game. I think it releases next year sometime where he's purely on tools, has never actually run the game itself. Again, nothing wrong with that work, nothing negative about it. It is to say that if you're thinking about these are the kind of studios and environments you want to be in, are those the kind of roles you'd be happy in and I mentioned that too, because part of my, my, why I do what I do is I've seen folks in my long time doing games and being in game scene, people who would spend six or seven years building up a case, a portfolio, going back to school to get a job that they then leave within a year or two. And they realize I actually kind of hate this. I don't actually like what the actual job is that I've spent all this time getting myself into. In which case, again, <laughs> you got to figure it out by trying on the shoe and see if it fits. If you can figure it out ahead of time, there might be other parties you have. Nothing wrong with doing these things commercially, but it is one of those considerations for that portfolio shape. And the other thing I'm going to throw in there, and this is uh, some people I think have a natural negative reaction to this, uh, of the importance of networking. And I think what people assume or imagine is going on is, well, I know Billy and Billy's underqualified, but he's my friend, so I'm going to bring him in. And the reality is for a lot of these, especially smaller companies, smaller teams, where you might have a better shot at they can assess you as a human being, as opposed to this wall of resumes that hit the bigger companies where they can just immediately throw in the trash if it doesn't have a certain degree, a certain GPA, a certain whatever, a certain number of years in industry. What's many, like they are afraid of any given stranger is a huge liability. They don't know anything about them. They don't know if they can trust them. They don't know if they're thieves. They don't know if they're going to embarrass them in public. And if they can start from, okay, before we even cast a wide net, who on this team knows somebody who could do the animations we need or who could do the soundtrack we need? And if they've worked together on something before, maybe it was a hobby, maybe it was a game jam, home team, student project in a college, whatever then they're more likely to be like, okay, well, this person, can we can we consider them? Can we bring them in, see if they kind of fit what we're looking for? Can they, would that be a match? They're often starting there before they even go out to the outside public. And this is also why it's so important to be, if you can, within your budget, et cetera, looking for ways to network locally. If you need to travel for it once, twice a year, GDC is still continues for better, for worse, to be one of the higher value environments for that. And that's often a longer term game in terms of networking, where I on one hand, I am sympathetic to the lens that like you should just be making friends. Don't worry about networking or whatever. I think there's a certain level of privilege that comes from you can spend that amount of money on travel and passes and just treat it like a vacation. I do accept that there's a certain level of like, I need to see an ROI on this. I need on some time frame for this expensive thing I'm incurring to make back its costs. And that could be a little more strategic, but ultimately part of that strategy is being nice to a lot of people, uh, not just attaching to one person who you get along with, but meeting a lot of folks trying to learn more about what they're doing, listening to what they have to do, because a lot of the better networking connections you're going to find are ones who at the time, neither of you in a situation to help the other one. It's only some years later where you're both doing holograms or you're both doing whatever the hell the future holds for us that you recognize on LinkedIn their post about it and you're like, hey, I'm doing that too now. 
let's chat. And that's where those opportunities come from. By the time you already currently need the job and they're on the HR side, there's a very different interaction happening there, uh, obviously, in terms of trying to navigate that space. Um, so we'll pop past that. I want to throw a few notes in there about avoiding burnout. And again, it's part because I'm all about how to do this stuff long term. This stuff can sound obvious uh, about, you know, take care of yourself. It's a marathon, not a sprint. One of my favorite things that I still think about this for when the first time, first summer out at EA when I was still an intern on Medal of Honor Airborne. And I fresh out of school slash out in between semesters. I kind of didn't have anything to go home to. So I just kind of sit around just tinkering because I was curious to learn. I was energetic still, you know, that kind of guess I'm still pretty energetic. But one of the things that happened was I would just kind of throw in and hey, what's another thing we can try? Because if we show it in the game, then maybe the team's going to be convinced it's a cool thing to do. And a more senior person helped me understand that one of the dangers that happens from that, there's a ripple effect of, oh, well, I might not mind doing that. But then if we're actually going to show the producers, the producers are going to say like, oh, yeah, this is great. But now we need the animations for it. Now we need the sound for it. Maybe we need the programmer to get the bulldozer working or whatever. And suddenly other people who were not actually by choice, fitting a little extra here and there, have to get pulled into that. And meanwhile, what's not budging is the Tokyo Game Show deadline, back when E3 was a thing, the ship date, the press reviews, etc., it creates more work for people who were not necessarily, even if it begins from someone voluntarily, being aware of the ripple effects that can have on a team. And this is part of why it's so important to have a managed schedule to be staying on top of. We're spacing and pacing things out. We're being smart about what we're doing. We're not just doing things kind of on a whim, where again, it's the work we do that wasn't planned or discussed that can create work for others. Being mindful of that. And then also looking out for making sure that whatever it is you like about making games, you're not you're not losing it if it doesn't necessarily fit what the company needs from you. And this is one of the reasons why even my my years when I was at a bigger company, I was still making four or five freeware hobbyist games on the side, not selling them, not on Steam, not commercially, not competing in the same space. But I needed that, right? And again, this is like people who need to dance, need to dance, people who need to sing, need to sing. Painters got to paint. Uh, and in many ways, I actually found that helped me deliver better work for the job that I had an outlet instead of trying to fit Instead of either A, ignoring that side to myself, I want to make sound effects, I want to do level design, I want to do programming, I want to do writing, or trying to wedge that stuff into a game where I am not the right specialist to be doing that. And there is a game that's pretty narrowed down from my backstory, I didn't talk about the specific because I don't, again, nail, narrow down the people. There's a first person shooter that ends confusingly with a, with a flight sim for one level on the PC, and that flight sim is not well made. You shouldn't be playing a flight sim with a mouse, you shouldn't end a flight sim, you shouldn't end a first person shooter with a, with a mouse controlled flight sim. And par- apparently what happened, sort of a story from a friend who was on that team, was that the producer had always wanted to work on a flight sim and the chance never came up in their career. And so they saw they saw their shot and were like, this this is my outlet for it. I think that whole team, the Metacritic, the sales, the customers, the fans, everybody would have been better off if that had been a game jam, a hobby project, something on the outside of it. And there's this thing where you might say, okay, well, I'm already doing work that is programming, that is designed, that's you know, sound, whatever, music creation is doing more of that. Isn't that, isn't that what's going to burn me out? But there's a key distinction between if you're doing for other people, that drains our battery. If you're doing it for yourself, the way you think it ought to be done, the way you want to do it, to the level you want to do it, exploring your thoughts and your ideas, in many ways, and mindful, there's still an extreme you don't want to avoid, you can be recharging your battery from it. And so it's also like, to, like one of our earliest musicians we had in home team, he's made his career for many years selling soundtracks custom made for games on Steam. He was making music for our games in our little hobbyist kind of recreational practice space and we're like, what are you doing? Like, isn't this also your professional job or whatever? And he's like, yeah, but the difference is on his professional job, people kind of call him up and stress him out and ask for this and tell him, make it more like that. And, you know, make it sound more like this other thing. And in this case, he just kind of threw it over the wall. And it felt more like when he was in high school, just kind of jamming and riffing and having a good time and, and remembering what we like about it can be doing a little kind of lighter like that in a way of, you know, just doing things professionally can change our lens on it. So to me, that's been important. Part of why I'm as energetic, enthusiastic as I still am is, I've uh, released now way over 100 games. I just never stopped making little freeware stuff. Uh, four or five every single year continually. No matter what else my day job or other stuff was, I got to keep making games and I haven't lost touch with what I like about it. And so that's what I say about the Burnout stuff. I want to also say to keep networking even when we don't have to. There are folks where there's a common pattern across game developer communities, meetups, IGDA chapters. We saw it in LA. I've seen it in other cities. I saw it in Atlanta where there's often a pattern of the people at networking events are either very, very early career, fresh out of school, trying to find jobs, trying to figure out, we look at my portfolio, we look at my resume, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. On the other side of it uh, are very, very senior people. They worked on games a lot of years ago. They want to give back. They want to help out. They want to find community. 
want to pass on the learning that they have and share stories. And that's all good. A lot of mid-career people do not go to networking stuff. They kind of have a click and it's their coworkers who are behind the same NDA. And one downside to that is that any given time, a whole lot of people, and again, this is, we've seen a lot of it this year, a whole lot of people get laid off for something that is in no way their fault. It's not that anyone didn't do their job, didn't show up, wasn't good at the role. It's just that, well, the studio didn't renew that license. This whole franchise is getting spun down. We just kind of, the tax incentive stopped making sense for Montreal or whatever. And all of a sudden, a whole lot of people are displaced. And the ones who have the best shot of landing on their feet and another opportunity that's a better match for what they'd actually like to find are the ones who did not for years just take off the time from networking. And so I, I also encourage this because it's part of also, I think, a version of long-term giving back. And this is where I've been happy to be part of IGDA or Indicate over the years, et cetera, of trying to be that person who, when you go to those events early in your career, and maybe again, you're kind of finding your footing or figuring out, is this for you? And what do you, you know, what advice are you trying to find? You kind of find yourself wishing you had some married career people who are there who can give you current recent answers about the things that they've seen, examples and stories and stuff, not, not in particular at their studio, just what they've seen in their own recent path. And you want to become that answer for other people, right? That can be you provided that once you are in a better spot to do those, you still find a chance to get out there once or twice a Thursday, a month or whatever to talk to people, even if you don't seem like it is a pressing need, it is, I think, better for you and also better for the community of game developers as a whole. So that's my little case in there. And actually, you know what? This reminded me talking about that, the portfolio stuff. I want to throw back to one other note about this portfolio thing. A lot of people do this where uh, I, I'm often advising people on her portfolios anymore. And their reflex, right? Whether they're making copy on itch, text for itch uh, about their game or on their website portfolio or whatever, they'll act like they're trying to sell you on the game about why this game is exciting, why this game is fun. And keep in mind, is like you are not trying to sell the game. You're trying to sell yourself on your portfolio. So far more useful than this game is an action-packed adventure and this character, whatever's. It's, I solved this problem on this. I did this to work on the following technical issues or to take this approach to see what happened when I use this angle and process for my art or something. Approaching the angle is much more useful because that's what they're really kind of assessing it on. They're also unlikely to play the game, so make sure you've got screenshots, video clips, etc. Uh, and then the two other notes, while well, I'm on the kind of portfolio riffing for one last shot on that. Uh, making sure you express how many teammates did you have and how long did you do it. And and this should be bird's eye view. You don't have to click through. You're not burying it behind another page. Tell us up front how many people were on it, how long did you work on this project. Because oftentimes, again, what they're looking for at studios is they'd rather see you, and this is part of why in home team we focus on longer term projects and teams where we can, is that they'd rather see you can work with other people. They'd rather see that you can have the discipline to go beyond two or three days of a game jam. And if you don't say how long you spent and how many worked on it, they assume it's a solo project or a weekend game jam. Those aren't bad. You should, by all means, include those in your portfolio as well. But if you have other stuff as well, it can help differentiate you and set you apart. If you can make that case and other people can't. Um, and that was, that was, I guess, a couple of little portfolios I just want to throw in there. It reminded me talking about this networking bit. Uh, yeah. I will. So I've also got a project management course, producer course. This is released only, I think, earlier this year. Uh, I guess at least updated earlier this year. Best seller in the category. It's not a super contested category, but it's honestly the problem that most people have on their projects, why they're not finishing their games. And the big thing, right, is that people think about, okay, I can program, but I can't program every project. I just need to get better at programming. Incorrect. It is actually a problem of you need to get better at project management. The level of programming is typically not the bottleneck or the art or the level design or the writing. It is the ability to pace a task, to space them out, to update your schedule and keep it relevant so you can fit in an evening or two a week outside of your other life you got juggling, come back to it a week later, pick it up and still inch that thing forward to release it on time. And this is where it's also a really powerful differentiator of if your portfolio shows time and time again, I release this, I release that, I release this, I release that. It is a much stronger thing in terms of that Pokemon deck people are fighting with in the HR space than kind of chipped away at a bunch of interesting things. There's some screenshots, there's some animations, can't really tell it never gelled. And just like we don't look at engines that don't have examples out there being used of games in your relevant price point, space, team scale, whatever, deployment platforms. In the same way, they don't want to be the one who sounds like, okay, here's the thing to think about, right? When you do something, you're getting better at it. You're getting better at it by practice. But if what you're practicing is not finishing projects, you're getting really good at not finishing projects. And if I take someone who's a talented person and not finishing projects and I put them on my team, that is a liability risk that their way of thinking, that their whatever it is, that's preventing from finishing stuff. Now, it's not because you're a bad person. It's often because we don't teach this stuff because it doesn't fall into the purview of, well, that's not technically a computer science degree. It's not technically what the art students are supposed to be doing. But if you want to produce stuff and make stuff, solo run a team, 
that's what this course is about. I'll also say that whygamedev.com survey out of the gifts. One of the gifts is this course. So maybe do that survey before you buy it. Um, I'll also say that Udemy frequently runs big promotions. Like it's just an issue of the space. I want to be upfront about this. Sometimes it's $11 or $15. Maybe catch it then. Uh, and if it's not, refresh the site in two days. You'll find a better price on it. That's just the nature of how that video platform works. Uh, let's spend the rest of time discussing questions. They were kind of down to maybe 10 up to an hour, but you know, had a little bit of hanging out here. Uh, any questions at all people want to chat about? My main stuff I do is hometeamgame.com. You want to read about that. I'm not saying it's a fit for everybody, but there's certain things if you've got objectives you're trying to drive towards for career, for funsies, for leading and making your own projects. It's a space where you support a lot of people in that, in that kind of environment. Uh, I see a note here from one of our people that a lack of good project management is especially bad in the indie space. Heard from a friend. It's also bad in giant companies too, for what it's worth. <laughs> it's just more catastrophic maybe in the uh, indie space. Looks like another question coming up. Excited to see this. And again, feel free to type them in the text, folks. I think the I found my chat bubbles in the top right for Discord, which despite running a, one of our home team groups in Discord, I still am relatively newer to using this for video chat. All right, so what do I think is the hardest part of remote work and post-COVID remote craze finds himself in a lot of those remote possibilities despite the popularity? Sure, so I chose the remote life in 2015, a long time before everybody else had to. Um, that's my native domain. That's my preferred space. I think it has a lot of advantages. I think the biggest problem that we saw, whether it's for how educators are trying to do it, which not to blame educators, everyone was caught off guard, or studios, is they were trying to take a format that worked when you are in person and then pretending like that's going to work online. There are vastly fundamentally from the roots differences that are better processes for asynchronous, that are better processes for people having flexibility around the stuff. Um, I will say a couple things to keep in mind that if nothing else, practical tips, because again, we're all kind of fighting the same problem regardless, is A, Find ways to differentiate your workspace from your not workspace. And this is something that as simple as I use, I've mentioned a couple of my courses, different browsers. It doesn't matter, right? I don't care Firefox or Chrome or Opera or Edge or Safari. They kind of are all basically the same. But like one is my personal browser and one is my work browser. So even if I am in my work browser, different URLs auto complete, different accounts are auto signed in. There's different bookmarks. There's different. And even the fact that I know you could use workspace in the same browser, one reason I like different browsers for this is that they have slightly different UIs. And I'm like, no, this is my office. And now that it's after hours, and I finished all the work call. Now I'm in my play zone. It's the same computer screen. That helps me. Uh, it's sort of like the same problem too. I think of when college students try to study sitting in bed, they either fall asleep or they can't sleep because now they're in study mode. Trying to not mix your space any more than you can. If you have a section where you can go sit in a slightly different arrangement, I think that helps us a little bit for remote stuff. Uh, I think too, there's a lot of places where, and this is again, kind of resistance from a culture that kind of only knew how to work in a non-remote environment where they kind of depended on the office for everything. They depend on the office for their social life. They depend on their office to be the other people in their world. They depend on the office to be things to do. Uh, if you are doing remote work, then I think the onus and the freedom goes on you to go find other answers to those questions. And that's going to mean that you're having to be out there kind of figuring out who else do you want to hang out with? Find affinity groups, meetup.com. If you're in an area that supports that, find friends who want to play Dungeons and Dragons on the weekend. Uh, but you can't just sort of assume that it's going to be the same of like, okay, well, my friend group is also my coworkers. Now, the thing I like about this and part of why giant companies hate this and want to force everyone back into the office is that also makes it safer for you to relocate or leave of part of what glues people into a large institution is that like, well, I can't leave because my friends are all there. And it's honestly too, like, a, again, I've been fully remote for most of my life and work now for so many years. A lot of my best friends are actually online and have been for most of my life. Every time I've moved between Atlanta and San Francisco and LA and Berkeley and Pittsburgh and Plymouth and where I am in the Boston area, et cetera. Now, I kept the same friends. I kept the same collaborators. I kept the same students. I could be in Iceland. No one know. And that flexibility is really important to me. But I think it's one of those things that, again, comes from... You can actually, you're in a better spot to still be looking for other outside work if you're in a remote situation. That is harder if you're like, well, I can't even fit in an interview because nine to five, I'm twiddling my thumbs. Some of the things that help people write is uh, occasionally some sort of other touching base. The Some people do the video standups in the mornings or something else to kind of orient. What have we been doing? What's going on next? Is there any blocking opportunities coming up between people? Uh, some of that's the producer lens, even bring it to your own work and your own habits. It's being proactive about communicating stuff. It's trying not to surprise people on. If something is taking longer than you expected in an office, it's really easy for someone to kind of come by and just notice or check in. It is more awkward and hard to poke and practically pull at that. So you want to make sure you're forefronting. If this is going to take longer than you expected, if there's a trade-off to be made, if 
you can foresee that this is not coming together the way it had been discussed. The sooner you let others know, the better. It doesn't mean you're in trouble. It means that something can be done about it because you have raised a flag about, hey, heads up, um, from what I'm seeing on the ground out here, there's something we should probably discuss or be aware of. Like, do we want to take longer? Do we want to spend more money on it? Do we want to cut? What should we cut to make sure we can get this under the deadline or whatever? But proactivity is a big part of the communication. Uh, the other thing might be, and it sounds silly as it is, but like, fresh air, go for walks, get out, et cetera. Uh, part of what also happens inherently, and this is me working the past school year, one day a week at Northeastern for a couple classes filling in. It gave me a reason to get out of my apartment like once a week that otherwise outside of like groceries, I don't have a lot of reason forcing me to. And part of what people just have naturally in their rhythm, like dogs need to be walked, is that when they go out to their office, they are getting out somewhere else. They are seeing the outside world. They are being in a slightly different part of town, at least. To, to again, if you are remote, to then not just be like, oh, this is great. I never have to leave my little hamster cage. No, absolutely not. Get the hell out of there, right? Like walk to a gas station, get a cookie, uh, check out a dead mall in your area, do a loop around the block, whatever. But um, just because you don't have to get outside. Uh, and I say this again, poking fun at myself. That's me. A bunch of people in my circles too, to be honest. It is just like you have to walk a dog. You got to walk yourself. Um, yeah, yeah. And in Maine, you got plenty of reasons to go outside. Uh, I hear that. And this is, a, you know, exercise. So it's also a thing I've liked about, I've got my little weights next to my desk. I can just sort of space it out, put it in here and there. I don't need, like a full gym or anything, but like, that's really convenient in a way I'm not awkwarding out somebody else at the office, but like in my home space, whatever. And I can kind of just spread it out the day, taking advantage of that. So my health isn't deteriorating too bad. If you need a standing desk, walking desk, whatever you can set up, making use of that can make a big difference for you. Um, oh, the other thing, right. And this is where even if you are mostly in text on a Slack, on a discord, on a Trello, on some alternative, now Trello screwed up their deal or whatever. In those kind of cases, even an occasional video chat with a client, with the people you're working with, whatever I think goes a long way. If it's possible in person, at least once ever, uh, if you can find an excuse where you're passing the area to meet up once or twice, because the thing we find is that the effect is obviously just because we're wired like this, best in person. Secondary video is not bad, especially someone who got their Zoom legs. More people are themselves on video than they used to be because we had to for three years. But when you have heard someone talk and you've seen their expressions and you get a sense of their energy, you read their text so much differently. You have a sense for like, are they joking? You have a sense for how serious they are. You have a sense for how worried they are. You have a sense for that's just how Patrick talks or whatever. And so I think that's an important thing that if you can fit that in there with some regularity um, or at all, It'll make your emails with each other more productive. It'll make your text easier. And this is where also in like, you know, uh, I don't love standing meetings in the sense of just like recurring, but it is where some sort of other beat of, I think about like when I was in grad school, I'd make updates on my research basically every two weeks because that's when I had meet with my grad advisor, Celia Pierce or Ian Bogost or whoever it was different years, Brian McGurko, uh, John Sharp and stuff. And what happened was like, because I already had a reason to have a conversation with them, I could then piggyback other concerns or thoughts on top of that, that, hey, I was also wondering about this for my career. Or I was also thinking about this other thing. And it's a version of that serendipity that tends to happen occasionally in offices and best case scenarios at the lunch counter, at the water cooler, whatever that's harder to find online. This is where, again, it might take in a little extra effort of deliberateness. So this is part of why in home team, we once a month have an industry guest speaker. All this audio goes out as our podcast, hometeamgamedev.com slash podcast, 200 interviews, little free throw plug in there. But like part of why we do that is our home team members have the option to sign in there and just chat with each other if they want to hang out for an hour after off the record. And for some people that really helps them kind of then work together on the projects, that kind of an outlet to surface ideas, to riff on some things, get some things out of their talking through a thought process together. Uh, but again, in that kind of way, I think even having like a, things like this are great, attend stuff like this, um, speak up with questions. And this is not just to say because I want questions, but also I do. Uh, I think it's good for you. And um I'll throw out there too. As actually, while well, we can kind of look, wait for another question, see if someone's typing, which is good for you. Uh, looking for another question. Uh, when you do go to GDC, or my main, a couple of tips for that, it can be done way cheaper than most people do it. Um, do not buy the expensive passes. A $250 Expo Pass, which granted, not super cheap either, but a $250 Expo Pass, it'll still get you past security for five days a week in the current schedule. And real value is the people in the hallways, the people in the park, talk to the people there. Uh, I've seen folks who they apply for the CA program. They want to be a volunteer. They don't get accepted. They feel like, well, now I can't do it. And granted, I think they'd have a small pay for now CAing, but ultimately it was the major cost was going to be the flight and the travel, the the, the shared Airbnb or, or hostel space anyway. So it's not that much more to do the expo pass if you can still make it work. 
And then the, the other kind of thing I teach for that is basically, I think of it as fish and networking. If you're trying to find lawyers, server engineers, writers, whoever you're trying to meet, figure out what talk they're going to. Because the real value is who the talk gets in the room. Figure out what time the talk lets out. Go merge into that crowd as they come out of there and you're surrounded by 50 of them and just start talking to them. And you save yourself another hour. You could spend in the hallway networking, talking, sitting down with strangers. Um, to not feel weird about that in environments like that. Networking is kind of like a uh, freshman year of college. Everyone's discombobulated. Everyone's there to try to get the most out of the week. They're kind of tired. They don't want to their approach. You might bounce off some who are like, I'm busy. I'm having a meeting. I'm preparing for a talk. That's fine. Respect them. You know, best wishes to you. I'm going to try again. Go sit at some other table. Be like, can I talk to you all about what you're doing? That kind of thing. I wonder how you balance project management and improvisation. Obviously, improvisation is less prof possible professional setting. Professional projects and portfolio pieces found to be helpful on some level for avoiding burnout. So absolutely. Uh, yeah. So the big distinction here in my professional roles at bigger companies, whether it was for EA games, whether it was for uh, what became PopCap San Francisco before it's called that, whether it's uh, Will Wright Stupid Fun Club. My expertise is actually as a rapid prototyper. And it's also part of why my YouTube videos that are more viral are me just doing a speed demonstration, writing code that should not be shipped, maybe shouldn't go into a repo, maybe no one else's eyes should look at it, but it's just kind of like trying it out in the worst way possible, knowing that like, I'm not giving an architecture class, I'm trying to figure out like, how does this feel on device? And I think the important thing for that is to really give yourself permission to absolutely slop it up, right? Like, do not try to do it correctly if that's not the point. If you're not trying to get your electrical engineering degree to keep satellites in the sky or whatever... Uh, and if you're just like, oh, I just want to trash and thrash and try some stuff, then you got to write for the waste paper, waste paper basket. You got to be doing prototypes or riffing or improvisation, expecting most of this will not be going forward. Most of these ideas I'm trying are not going to be good. This also, also avoids you painting yourself into a corner of now I have to go forward with it because I spent three damn weeks just trying this thing. And now I feel like it's my baby I don't want to get rid of, as opposed to like, eh, I kind of got it half working by 2 p.m. I have to try two or three other things. And it's also so important because I think you got to do comparative assessment. So many things in design, it's impossible to sit there and kind of do a spreadsheet and calculate and envision and really predict exactly what's going to be. You got to try several things in parallel to be able to look at it and be like A, B, C, or D and waste 75% of that. And that's not waste. That's the only way forward. And it's also going to point back from the Mark Cerny talk, The Method 2002. People should look it up if you haven't seen it. Outstanding talk influencer, every company, studio has ever since for decades. But a big part of that is the assumption an outdated way of doing business is the idea that nothing should be wasted and expecting like waste is a part of the process. And this is also why it's the difference between like our, our personal projects don't burn us out the way the same that commercial games do. Commercial games have to have a lot on the editing room floor, right? A lot of work people did, good models, good sound, good art, good code, could never get used, just was not the absolute final, perfect, cohesive picture they could put together. That was what was necessary to sell a product. That is really taxing. As a creative person, as a problem solver, it does not feel good to do work that gets left behind. No one can see it. It's like if you're in a Hollywood film and you were like, you were in a scene for Star Wars, but they didn't use that shot. And you're just like, gross. I was really proud of that. And now I can't even talk about it. Yes, that's the talk. Die Summit 2002, um, Mark Cerny. And Mark Cerny's gone to a ton of other stuff for PlayStation, et cetera. His early career was doing Marvel Madness and he's worked in Japan, Europe, and the US. He's able to cross-pollinate some best practices across national, international cultures and stuff. Great talk. Um, but yeah, I sort of sidetracked myself there. But anyway, uh, whatever, whatever it was, couldn't have been that important. Um, yeah, it looks like we still got another question coming up. Opinions on having works in progress your portfolio. Two pieces still in progress to feel they are valuable assets to have. Plans to finish this. Oh, actually, let me finish my other note before I talk, saw this Mark Cerny question. Uh, obviously, you might need to refactor that trash you wrote in the rapid prototyping case. You don't just keep building on that. However, my other asterisk on that is a lot of other code honestly can and sometimes should ship in worse shape than it could be written. You need to optimize your time as the human being, your time as the team. And so often what I try to do is if you're all familiar with like lazy evaluation, which isn't what it sounds like for people not familiar with the term, it's basically a programming term or technical term for the functions don't execute until like they have to until the problem needs that level of detail being assessed. It's basically when or if there's a practical reason to refactor it, then you do it. When the mess becomes a, is it's about to become a problem because you're about to have to copy paste a bunch of code or build more on it, you need to maintain it, et cetera. It's going back into something more critical. That's when to refactor it, not preemptively rewriting everything, or you can spend your whole life rewriting the same guy six times and releasing anything. All right, sorry, this question about work in progress. Uh, need to finish eventually, looking for a job soon. Remove those. So this also, this differs by discipline, this differs by company size, et cetera. There are artists who will say, uh, you know, your weakest thing in your portfolio is. They're going to judge you by that. So cut out all the trash. Um, there are professionals who will be 
you know, again, like the worst code you have is they're reading into that. If they're very technical lens that they're reading your GitHub, et cetera. Uh, but it depends on the circumstances. It depends on the fit. And this is where, again, it might be, it, it's wild west out there. One challenge I've had is that I've had HR people who over the years, I first interviewed one, I think in 2003 about what they look for in games. And that guy was like, oh man, you know what we like to see on the resumes? We like to see, we like to see an objective statement. We like to see your outside interest. We like to know that you like to do skiing or, you know, cross country, give us something to talk to you about. And then I talked to some woman probably four years later, major recruiter, but Later, Activision Blizzard, she helped me get in my initial role. And she was talking about how, like, actually, we hate that stuff. Don't show us that. Leave it off your resume. Focus on what you've done. Tell us that story. And, you know, leave your hobbyist stuff at home. And the, the challenge is it depends who's looking at it. Right? And this is why, again, I'm figuring out, okay, well, can I reverse engineer who has a public presence that works at that company? Can I learn a bit about what their link, what's on their LinkedIn? Do they have a resume that's public? And maybe, maybe not. But like, how can I figure out what they want from me? Oh, in order to kind of figure out, you're going to put your best case out there. At the end of the day, I think people kind of overthink a little too much that like, well, if I just have the right phrase or trick or whatever, then that's what I will or won't get the job. The reality is oftentimes there's pretty sensible people making these decisions, despite all evidence to the contrary or feelings. Otherwise, there's sensible people really sizing up. Can you do the job we need you to do based on looking at what you've got? They're making a decision based on that. That's as well informed as it can be. If as long as you're clear about that, this is a project you're doing work in progress. Can you tell me when it's going to be done? That certainly helps. There's also the thing we're in home team again, because we, every project we start at 200, at least every single game on time, when it starts, we know what date it's releasing because we're saying we're going to release the best versions we can by August 15th or whatever. But there's a level of discipline and maturity that says, I'm working on this. It'll be finished December 1st. That's a different lens than like, I'm kind of fumbling around. I got like kind of these pants on this weasel. I don't know where it's going. Like that doesn't sound very concrete as opposed to I am doing this as a character study. I have, you know, here's how it fits into why I'm doing it. Or especially again, if it like really barks up the right tree. And so an example like for this, uh, I don't want to be digging too specific on names here. There was a guy who was working at a startup. He wanted to go work for a, a indie game that was pretty reputable or indie game company, pretty reputable. And he basically did a game jam that was sort of like really blatantly pandering to like the kind of games that that studio designs. And was it just the jam? Sure. But well, like, was it an interesting conversation piece that like he took a look at how they design and the kind of lens that they bring to stuff and seems very self-aware and appreciative of that when there came to the internal conversation of who to bring on, it's probably a point in his favor. That this person really cares about this studio in particular and didn't just blanket apply to a bunch of stuff. And we just happen to be one of them. They want to be here. That sounds like a person on a team. Ooh, speaking of which, another kind of early career tip here. Uh, often when I'm sharing this, I'll credit this one. It's just Christy Stoll. Uh, she was major recruiter, a bunch of game studios. Again, helped me out early in my career in terms of me finding my first opportunities. Uh, and she would talk about how I think the studio interviewed eight different animators for something. The one who was the least good animator, everybody on the team was like, bring us that one. That's the one we want. She was like, they're, they're the least good animator. And they talked about like, well, yeah, but we want that person in the office every day. We want to interact with them. They're just so full of energy, so full of life. They seem so positive. And remembering that, yes, you need skills. You need to be able to do the job. They're like, well, help that person figure out the animation the hard part of being a recruiter isn't can you find someone who can write the code or do the models or make a level? It's the intersection of that and the Venn diagram and people want to be around them every day. And they seem pleasant. They seem supportive. They seem open to feedback. They seem professional. They seem self-aware. Uh, it's the soft skill side of stuff that more often than that's probably the limiter. And again, this is where I think people can like, you know, you want to care about iterating on your portfolio, iterating on your resume. Um, at the end of the day, though, it's also going to be making sure you're also working on yourself. And this is part of why Home team is all about the team project stuff. And again, it's not the only thing doing teams, but if you're on jams, do teams. If you're at school, do teams. Uh, is a different lens that in many cases, companies want you to work on a team. They're not bringing you to just your solo thing. And it helps to have shown like, I can work in a code base other people are working in too. I'm not resistant to that. I'm not pushy. I'm not overriding and steamrolling others. That's the kind of thing like they need to read on that. And if all you've ever done is really impressive solo stuff, that's great. Go knock it out the park out there alone. Uh, but they typically, that's actually a liability to a company of, if you haven't worked with teammates and can demonstrate you've released stuff, um, with teammates, et cetera. Uh, let's see, uh, not to brag, uh, let me show this next question. Yes. Not to brag, uh, having in a career spot now where he feel, feels relatively secure tech artist that I shouldn't have even started that word. Um, but I've been here 1.5 years job isn't tied to a specific production, make a lot of marketing art, any AAA early mid career pitfalls, keep an eye out for. Uh, yeah. So again, so like mentioned earlier, the, the continue networking, um, the other part, and I don't know how much this is, I'm going to put an asterisk here. I mostly work with technical game designers, with programmers, with producer people, 
art and audio are professions that I acknowledge what I don't know. Um, it's a little like one of these things like your neighbor who doesn't know anything about law will speculate about all kinds of legal politics and what they think fair use is. Actual lawyers like, I'm a divorce lawyer. You need to talk to a real estate lawyer, right? Or it's like some of your, your uncles have opinions about medical stuff. And actual doctors like, I'm a heart surgeon. You need to talk to a skin doctor or whatever. Knowing your specialization is a thing. So I will say I feel out of scope to discuss uh, necessarily art side things. I'll say at least within the tech art sphere, this again, making sure that you are staying ahead of pipeline changes. It, it comes for all of us uh, in games. And I my favorite memory for this is an old book. I think about Andre Lamoth writing about, he was teaching Win G. I probably told the story recently in some other video because it's always in my mind. And he was teaching Win G. And that was a, a part of how I did Windows graphics early on. And someone in the, the room was asking like, okay, Andre, we're going to learn this. As long as you can promise it's the last time we have to learn another different graphics. And she was like, get the hell out of here. You're in the wrong industry. Like, that's not how this is going to work. And she was like, when G became DirectX, um, most of us don't hand write DirectX anymore. The world's going to keep changing. And so making sure that you are kind of not just settling in on, okay, I've got a really comfortable thing. That is how it worked uh, before. I'm just going to really settle in on that. This is not a great line of work for that. This might also mean looking at uh, any given time when there's these emergent spaces going on that any given, you know, question marks is VR on its way out or on its way in is AR on its way out or on its way in is whatever other experiment the industry is trying to give in time. Casual games had this space. MOs had this space, ca- whatever kind of times keep shifting. Things that used to not be a concern may become a concern. Suddenly we're worried about battery power and headset and frame rate in a way that we were not when it was all running on a machine. Suddenly we're worried about uh, different challenges of entire shader pipelines we can't use because we're doing web deployed games. And that's a different way to kind of solve this problem. Um, the other thing to also look out for again is a, uh, I don't know how to be too, i to try to figure out how to frame this carefully. Basically, there is a approach to work, which is traditionally the shape of the world around us that it certainly is how the world was when my father was coming up a generation ago of he would go to a company, they would have a job, you would do that job, you would be paid for your job, and then that was that. And there's a place for that. Those will, things like that will keep happening. I do think it is increasingly important in some mixture, this is just the nature of the potential for online presence, for public footprint, et cetera, to at least have the backup options of, are you still building an identity of your own you can fall back on separate from the company you're attached to? Because ultimately, a lot of these companies, they would actually rather, and I get why, they would rather you not be a semi-known quantity. That kind of puts them in a harder negotiating spot. If the world's going to care that they lose Samantha or whatever, like that's, they don't like that. They would rather you disappear into making this enormous thousand person project happen. Like you don't worry about which welders the cruise ship had working on it, but your life raft, if, or when, again, and assuming you do nothing wrong, your student has nothing wrong, the team, the student, whatever, but like a whole thing just the world changes. You know, I've got friends who worked on arcade games and pinball machines. This stuff's gone. And like, I'm aware that like it technically still happens, but it doesn't. Um, like there's entire spaces that it might just be, I don't know, in six years, no more console games. Why? Beats the hell out of me. Smartphone games stop happening. Why? I don't know. World's, world's complicated. Culture shifts. People used to eat out. Now they don't. People used to see movies. Now they don't. Whatever. So malls were a whole thing. They seemed indomitable. Oh, they're so gone. And so just being cautious of The fallback plan you've got is what you can speak to that you did under your own volition that you control, that you own. And that might be, you know, expressing yourself in other ways and obviously making sure you're not crossing any lines of the studio's not upset. You're doing anything adjacent too much to what the company's doing. But that is where my own case and granted there's a little bit of privilege here of not everyone wants to be visible on the internet. That's a whole trade-off to me. I'm not saying this to go beyond videos or something, but it is something where are you still doing art that just explores your interest or tech art for them? It explores your interest, your skills, growth, et cetera, separate from what right now there's a company demand in the specialization role that you're in, that they need you to do, that they'll pay you to do. And this is also part of why I just found I wasn't as good of a fit for the giant company because they really, and again, I, I appreciate, I respect it. I get it. Why? But like they needed me to fit in a, in a pigeonhole. I, I had been used to making small games for so many years. I wanted to do I was there as a technical level, technical, technical designer doing level design and some related tools. I liked writing some code related to it, like doing some sound related. Like, they needed me to stay out of that stuff because they hired someone who was really good at those different things. And again, I appreciate that's how the process works. It's part of why, no matter who gets hit by a bus, the company keep ticking. They can replace a specialist. It's harder to replace someone who's got their hands in too many things. But as a human being, and this is again back to like, why are you doing this? What do you love about it? What do you get out of it? 
to me, it's very important to not lose sight on, I have my ideas I want to express and, and kind of zooming out. And I don't know if this is true about you, but again, for a lot of people who've gotten to games, there's something they want to tell. There's something they want to explore. There's something they want to try to get out of the system. There's just ideas that are interest them in a certain way that may not be what the company is necessarily either paying them to do or that they could be public about them doing if it was done for the company or that they would own the controls and rights to. Uh, and it's also sort of a help, help, helpful thing for if, like a lot of our people on some sort of timeline, this is a brutal way to put it, but hey, it's a game dev stress talk. Uh, a lot of other fields pay better and are more stable for like the same level of skill because they're making business to business transactions of if they can offer a superior product at a better price, there's just money on the table. As opposed to as in a creative industry, it's like trying to make a best selling album or to try to make a show people want to watch and talk about, which means you can get all kinds of stuff right and it just doesn't land, doesn't make the numbers, which makes it a very volatile industry. People got to move every several years, et cetera. So because of that, a lot of people later in their careers uh, do wind up pivoting out of the game space. It's one of the reasons why we do not unfortunately have as much seniority as some other fields do. Why we wind up seeming to keep making the same youthful, oblivious mistakes in team management and studio structure and how funding works, etc. cetera. Uh, but it is a thing to be aware of, of like, okay, well, the shape of your career, if it was in some adjacent company and it wasn't actually in games, what other things could you be doing? And are there some things you can be kind of think of inflating the life raft before my Titanic scripts an iceberg? But even as for your own personal life priorities, say you want to relocate sometime, you want to shift some form, maybe you want to shift into teaching as just a, you know, you like giving back, you like working with beginners, you like their energy, trade-offs that come with that. And again, I can talk about it all day. It's a different topic, but it is to figure out if your future career took you some different direction, what does your kind of plan B or C look like? And it may not be a hundred percent identical to what the current day job is. And then thinking about how to continue growing for that, just because the world keeps changing, tech keeps changing, consumer desires keep changing, markets, how games get paid for. Uh, and then they get designed very differently around subscriptions or about Game Pass or about, uh, you know, a handful of games dominating the top 10 of Steam for, say, 15 years or something. But I think we're near in the end. I'll take if maybe if there's one more question, everybody has one. Otherwise, we can kind of call it. Yeah. So, and so the question for those who, again, I'm not recording the other side of the line is basically uh, in a role that involves working with very early career people uh, in games, school or colleges or fresh out of school with degrees uh, might be their first role trying to figure out other things to be doing to kind of help you better mentoring or passing on best practices and stuff and a variety of this stuff. I mean, right. And one of this is just sort of a general thing to keep in mind. This is honestly for all human relations within companies is to make sure you're obviously engaging people as people and not just as functional. Do you have programming questions? No, then go away. Um, having some understanding of, you know, just them as human beings and a well-rounded person. Uh, there was a question there about like, are there things different about this generation? And I think there is a level of, I was surprised when I first started this stuff, my game club in 2004 was totally in person. It was a college club, 2010, totally in person, college club. When I started this current LA, it was originally an LA based group before home team was worldwide. It was all, we met every single week in the public library in Beverly Hills. And we thought in person was just, we had to do till even we started experimenting online. Even people who live in the same city preferred it. And then post pandemic, a bunch of people were forced to try online for several years. And I've been, I've given four talks at GDC, two or three were about this kind of pattern of how I run clubs. And I was getting emails from people who were trying to start college clubs. I was like, Chris, I can't get people to come to the room. They all want to be on Discord and do stuff remotely. Like, how do I get them in the room? And I was like, maybe you listen to what they want and you figure out how to make it work on a Discord because they've tried that and they have decided they prefer the flexibility. If there may be other trade-offs, maybe it's 85% is good in some ways, but also they don't want to wait in traffic. They don't want to blow off their Friday night. They don't want the commute. They don't want whatever. Um, figure out what it is that they want, what the priorities are. It, I think there's been a book about the, uh, the purpose economy. It's not as gross as that title sounds. It's honestly just a recognition of a generation that seems more mindful of, is this work purposeful? Is it fulfilling? Is it doing good? Is it causing harm? In a, in a degree to which, again, it's, I don't know, it's not like I'm part in the middle of a generational war, but there may have been a generation uh, where it's kind of like, hey, whatever pays me most, let's do it. Um, which honestly could have also been a reaction to coming out of really tough circumstances where they didn't have the opportunity to say no to stuff. But it's been a mixture of that combined with, and again, this is in the kind of the harsh economic realities and knowing housing prices are ludicrous, rent is ludicrous, pay is low, minimum wage stagnated. So these are all game dev stress talk. I think I'll throw in there, right, is to recognize that as part of that and generationally, uh, they are not, there's not stigmatized the way it used to be to like, they live with their parents. Um, 
economically. They're saving up for other things now. They're not blowing thousands of dollars a month towards rent. They're fine with it. Their friends are fine with it. Their social groups are fine with it. They're on the same page of like, this is the shape of life in the world that we live in today. And that that has also enabled them. And I think in a good way to say no to what used to just be abusive workplace environment dynamics, bosses that made people cry, the circumstances that has grinded people down where now they're like, yeah, I don't need this and I'm not going to take it or, or, or deal with it. And I think that's been a, it's been a positive development. Um, but it is sort of, again, a generational shift that's been observed as far as circumstantially and otherwise. Uh, the other thing I'll throw in there too, and this is obviously a big part of what I do with home team is basically if there is something that you find there's a pattern to conversations you're having, you keep making the same points, you keep bringing up the same stories, you keep correcting the same mistakes, externalize that somehow. And that's where in home team, we've got a whole bunch of now books and videos and on like models, my video course, et cetera, things that conversations I've had 500 times in home team where I was like, I'm tired of having the same conversation. My, my free video course, code your first game.com, 375,000 students. That began as I worked dozens of people through my textbook on like how to program their first handful of like classic games using JavaScript and browsers to learn the fundamentals of programming. And I was like, I am tired of doing that, but I want more people to have that benefit. So it's a win-win. I don't have to do that song and dance anymore. I point to like, do the video and come to me when you have more interesting questions that build on what that covered. And the other benefit, it scales so much better. I am also not like, I could never have taught that many human beings the way I was originally doing it. So if you can find ways to bottle it, refine it, iterate on it, it's time well spent, not necessarily economically of like, you're not, you know, make it big on a Kindle book or like, it's not the reality for most people. And it's kind of worse than indie games, to be honest. But like, it is still a case where if you can document, externalize, maybe a Google doc, um, it doesn't have to be a published PDF or whatever, maybe a video that's internal use only, capture the learnings as best you can. And the other nice thing about capturing is that enables you to then iterate on it, build on it, make a sequel to it, position as part of a curriculum connected to something else. Uh, but that's the kind of, you know, improving the onboarding stuff of, okay, well, five people have been having these kind of mistakes over the years. Can we give them some tips up front that avoid that kind of mistake? It's part of why I like going out and giving talks like this when I can. So thanks for the opportunity to, of there's certain issues I keep talking about with people. And I'm like, well, if I can cover it in an hour of just free YouTuber, you know, chatting with the community or whatever, let's spare that trouble. Um, because my actual work is working with people like who are past that point, who are now doing the thing and they've got detailed questions or whatever. And moving people past that helps them, helps me, everybody wins. Um, if it's generalizable advice, share it generally. And I don't know, it could be little things you take for granted. Uh, I continue to be kind of baffled at the amount of TikTok videos or Instagram videos or YouTube shorts that are like really, really weird, short beginner things about the field that they're in. But remembering most people are at the beginning layer who have never heard this thing uh, and it's exposure to them for it. And I remember one of my first things I did that helped my blog take off. Now, it's the blog's discontinued. I'm going to name it, so it doesn't matter. But like I basically just get a whole article about the very fundamentals of using a command prompt because increasingly that was falling behind. No one was teaching that. That didn't come up anywhere, but you still needed it for certain build tools, for certain configuration stuff, certain basic operations you needed to do as a technical person. It was covered nowhere at a simple, here's the minimum you need to know level. And like that was good for my traffic because I was just like, I'm tired of explaining this. I want a thing to point to. I want to be able to go iterate on it if I find that there's things I wish I worded differently and then help get me traffic that I was able to convert into eventually ebook connections, newsletter folks, people in the careers kind of like run into me at GDC like, oh, thanks for that thing you did long ago. Like that helped me get my footing. Like, yeah, great. Um, and it wasn't even super time to do. It was just recognizing the pattern. And I've been working with actual people on these actual questions. If I can bottle that, it's redistributable pretty trivially because of technology. But that's my that's my bits on that. And also what I've been doing for 20 years. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, thanks again, everybody, for having me. Uh, it's been great. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome, y'all. Thanks for being here. Happy to do it. And actually, I'll throw this in there too. It's like part of why I did the recording thing. Again, I can post this to more people. And an example I bring up for this, it's part of my agreement for any time I'm doing anything. I, I probably give them, I think, over 60 talks for free over the years. But as long as I'm doing it for free, like I need to be able to record it, rebroadcast it. And that actually helps me also kind of like give a little more preparation for it. Because I was a case where I got flown out to Paris to give a talk. One human being was in the room. One person. Thank God. Thank God she asked a question at the end because the camera just pointed at me on my, my chalkboard. And I was like, uh, are there any questions? Yes, you. And then like a voice from behind. And I was like, hmm, let me address this question. But uh, like 800 people watched it on YouTube. So it didn't matter what person was in the room. I had a bigger audience and more people will probably watch whatever I slice out of a video of this than were able to be here live. That's just reality in the shape of the world around us. At the same time, it was better because y'all were here. I think we got some better questions. Better points came out of it. I'm thankful y'all were here live. I think we also tend to just, we're primed to pay better attention live than people start a video. And But anyway, again, thanks everybody for being here. Have a great weekend. Bye, y'all.